This episode of Luther and Answers is brought to you by our sponsor, Dial a Podcast. Dial a Podcast, proud sponsor of Luther and Answers, provides a simple yet powerful solution to bring your church's sermons and Bible studies closer to those who might be a step away from the digital world. Getting started with a local telephone number is easy, allowing anyone to listen to your content with just a phone call at their convenience. It's an excellent way for congregations of all size to extend their reach. Get started with a 30-day risk-free trial at dialapodcast.com and ensure no one misses out on your church's messages. So my mom's name is Lisa. So she's my first favorite Lisa. So you're going to be my second favorite Lisa. I'll I'll Uh, take second favorite in that. In that context, yeah. that's fine. You know, I'm yeah. cool with that. Uh, but you're my first favorite Cooper. Is that uh, allowed? I, I don't think that's allowed. Yeah. He's not the president anymore. He can't kick me out. He can't hurt me. This is because you haven't met my kids. They're way cooler than I am. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah. All right. So as if I meet your children, you might bump down the list. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I guarantee it? that will happen, actually. Just start talking about metalcore. You guys can just have like oh, your whole perfect. metalcore yeah. discussion. It'll yeah, be yeah. great. I was actually, I was, um, it was such a really fun conversation with Jordan at the convention to have that, like that whole, we like kind of, maybe I geeked out. Maybe I just did all the talking and he was just polite, but I remember it as we had a I whole conversation it. about it. Yeah, no, we uh, did. <laughs> which was great. Yeah. That's great. Is it difficult being um, online? Because, like, you're online, uh, but your husband is also online and, like, very popular. Is that weird? Uh, yeah. It's very weird. Yeah. I, I wouldn't say it's hard. It's just bizarre. Um, yeah. I think recently was the first time somebody came up to me and was like, oh, you're Lisa Cooper. Um, I know you because you've been on Jordan's podcast before. <laughs> I was like, oh. <laughs> So it'll, it's only happened to the me twice The names are a now, coincidence. But, um, but so random. Like the fact yeah. that people would recognize me because of Jordan is really, really odd. Um, yeah. I also think it's funny because Jordan is such a goofball. And <laughs> I think most people just assume that he's like some crazy high-flung academic, like pontificating yeah. all the time. Uh, but he's so silly. <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, he's a good dude. Yeah, I He's agree. a good dude. My, <laughs> thank God, <laughs> my favorite, my favorite, uh, my favorite Jordan Lisa thing, uh, was at the convention having a conversation with you. You had ridden with somebody else, I guess, to get up to the thing, or maybe Jordan had gone somewhere with somebody. I don't know, but being in a conversation with you and you being mid sentence, I don't even know if you realize you do this, but you will be mid sentence with somebody and say, Oh, Jordan's here. And then you're gone. That's it. You walk away. I'm too excited. I know. It's the cutest thing. <laughs> it's so cute. Yes. I still like him a lot. Yeah. Yeah. He's great. He's a fun guy. Um, but you know what uh, is also great is you're such a fun gal. You're uh, also great. Yeah. Tell me more about what you do. What do I do? What do you mean? Yeah. What do you do? You, well, so you're a mom. I am a mom. That is uh, the majority of what I do. Okay, probably. great. And uh, also uh, wife. That's some of what you do as well. Yes. Yes, uh, for sure. And then you uh, have your own professional life. I do. Can you talk about that? Is that talk aboutable? I, I can. Um, you're getting the scoop okay. because yes. um, this has changed in the last like week. So this just went from a secret members only episode to a primetime episode. Uh, just like did that. Did it? Just like that? Oh man. Maybe. Um, we'll see. <laughs> yeah, you're getting the exclusive scoop on this podcast. Um so I am I've done a lot of things over the years. Uh, I did the stay at home mom thing for a very long time. And I've sort of been editing writing on the side. Um and I did seminary while I was home with the kids. And so mm-hmm. the so second you're a I got woman gra- pastor. <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> so- <laughs> So I, um, let's see, I've done a lot of things. Right now, I am a full-time writer uh, for a ministry called Revelation Media. I just put in my two weeks notice, like, this last week. So 
yeah. will no longer be doing that soon. I'm going to be moving into like a consulting role at a different company. So oh, I yeah. will be doing that instead. And I'll still be writing devotions for them. So if anybody has signed up for the Revelation Media emails and uh, gets their devotions, those are still going to be me going forward, at least for the foreseeable future. So, so I do that. Um, I also part-time work at Chesterton House, which is a Christian study center at Cornell University. So I am the, they, they call anybody who works in any kind of faith capacity at Cornell a chaplain. We Lutherans would use the term very differently, obviously. Uh, yeah. we would, that has the connotation of like word and sacrament ministry for us, but it doesn't at Cornell. So the role is I'm doing ministry with a lot of young uh, college age women. So at this Christian housing community, they also host a lot of cool Christian events on campus. So I do that very part time. And then I also freelance write. So I've written stuff for a bunch of different publications. I think the one that I go back to the most is Barna. So I do a lot of like fun data reporting <laughs> in my spare time. So Ew. <laughs> <laughs> I really enjoy it. I really do. I love like the, it's it's interesting work to me to write well. So if you can take something kind of that seems dry or boring and make it fun and interesting, that's my jam. So I just really like writing. So I end up doing that in kind of everything yeah. that I'm doing. Um, I once heard a uh, Stephen King quote where he said that uh, he just writes six pages a day, no matter what. Like that's just, that's how he stays in the writing mode. Um, it sounds like you do a lot of different kinds of writing. Like I do. That's devotional what's so fun. writing, technical writing, all kinds of different. Do you yeah. find that just writing in general helps you write more and write better? Yes, definitely. I think it's all it's a craft, right? Like you're honing your skills all the time. Yeah. And I think the things that you learn in cuz I do a lot of marketing, copywriting too. Okay. Like as you're making compelling cases for things. You know, I want people to to buy the thing or to want the thing that I'm promoting. Um, it's a, it's an interesting skill to cultivate, like connecting with your audience. And I think yeah. that that kind of rolls into everything else you're doing, you know, I can see that um, connecting through writing. Cause you, you have to think a certain way, right? And then yeah. that you can, once you know how to click that on, you can click it on in interpersonal interactions as well, right? To relate to the people you're talking to and, Yes, I, I'm much better written in written form, though. <laughs> so <laughs> I get so when I'm in person with people, as you know, like I get way too excited about things. And so I have a hard time, like distilling that into phrases that make sense. Um, I just get too excited. So that's OK. When I'm that's... writing, I can take it down a notch and like make it make yeah, sense. You, yeah, you have the, uh, the benefit of editing. Yes, yes. Yeah, I do a lot of that. How too. I how I wish in my daily life. I had the benefit of editing what I'm talking, like when I'm speaking. Yeah, wouldn't that be great? God, I would save myself so much heartache. Uh, Sign me up trouble. for that. I want that I too. Know. It's got to be Elon Musk is, once we get the Neuralink, it'll be a premium feature and we'll yeah. be able to do it. You yeah. Know? 12 bucks a month. Yeah. Walk around Edit with the, the words check, before they come out. Like hovering above your head somehow. Absolutely. Like a hologram. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. Mm hmm. Yeah. That, see, that's the that's uh, the exact kind of capitalist hellscape that I hope we all get to live in one day. Uh, <laughs> where you just wake up and you have an advertisement beam directly into your brain, you know? Yikes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I, I'm cool with that as long as I'm the one writing the ad and getting paid for it, so. Right, yeah, then beam it out, right? Like yeah, if it's on it like out. a yeah. If it's on like a cost per view, how you're getting paid, <laughs> yeah. just, I want worldwide coverage. Let's go. On this. Let's go. Uh, yeah, we'll just do like all Lutheran theology. Perfect. Make it really exciting. <laughs> how how do you how do you do that? Make Lutheran theology exciting. Yeah, it just is. So okay, we'll Perfect. just Great. yeah, maybe Gerhard. We just we okay. We'll just get all Gerhard right. and like send him out in like tweet format, you know, directly Perfect. to people's brains. If we get uh, AI far enough and feed it the works of Gerhard, we might be able to sort of resurrect kind of a facsimile of his consciousness. Yikes. <laughs>
<laughs> that sounds scary. I don't like that. <laughs> no. no, that doesn't sound fun at all. How do you write devotional material? How do you do that? Oh, boy. So it depends. Um, it depends on the passage. So I have done the big thing that we've been working on at Revelation Media for the last four years. The whole time I've been there has been this animated Bible. And I don't know if you've seen this. I think I may have showed you um, at the convention. I know I showed somebody. I don't remember who I showed. Yeah, it wasn't me. Yeah. Okay. Never mind. It wasn't you. Um, <laughs> I have a terrible memory, too. So it's okay. Me too. It's fine. Um, anyway, we've been animating a chronological Bible. So we started in Genesis, as one does, because it is mm -hmm. at the beginning of the narrative. Sure. So makes sense. We've been animating through Genesis. And as we've been doing that, I've been writing email devotions every week. And so it started out that we were taking very, very, very thin slices of text. <laughs> so, I mean, right. the, I was writing devotions on like a verse, which <sighs> is wild yeah. to think about now. But now that I'm on the other side of it, I'm like, oh, yeah, no, that totally makes sense. But so for those things, I mean, I was very much in the original languages, like, reading commentaries, trying to figure out like what people are saying about it, and then thinking about things that could apply to regular everyday life. And mm -hmm. the audience for devotionals is not going to be, this is an ecumenical ministry, not my, not Lutherans, you know? Um, and right. so trying to distill things into something that is applicable and resonates with people that kind of come from all different backgrounds was a really interesting thing. So I did a lot of reading commentators from different perspectives. Hmm. Read a lot of Martin Luther, obviously, because he's got his Genesis commentary. That's great. But um, did not rant about the Pope. Not even once. I mean, yeah. I could have if I had gone off. Of should, the things that were in some that. would say should have. <laughs> um. If I had a uh, gone off of his commentary the whole time i would have had a lot of rants about the pope so I, as one the, should <laughs> yeah yeah the very first time i ever preached uh in a lutheran pulpit was a reformation day sermon and joe was like i'm going out of town good luck and so i Beautiful. got to preach yeah yeah he's great like that he uh uh the i i i went with i went with the devil and his dog, the Pope. I thought, yeah, that's good. And I, I think I probably stole that from Luther. But it's just, it's just chef's kiss, you know? It's a, Beautiful. Perfect, perfect. If you're going to dunk on someone. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, you're not, you're not the devil. Like, you're his dog. Yeah. You know, which is great. Because it's, uh, I don't know. It just hits, it checks the boxes. It know? does. It does. I have, uh, have you recorded any of your sermons? Quite a few. Quite have you posted few. them um, online? No, I, um, I keep the, I, I have just about all of my manuscripts and I keep, I think I have most of the recordings, I have a fair amount of the recordings. I'm preaching more now than I used to. Uh, but Dean reached out and told me that I needed to keep them and record them. And that they would be useful for the ALTS maybe later on or so. I don't, I don't know. But he told me to record them and keep them. So that's what I've been doing. Cool. Yeah. 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 I want a recording of that one. <laughs> yeah. It was like my very first one. I don't know if I have a video or even an audio recording of it, but I think I might have the manuscript for it. Um, I'll look around after I, after we get done and I'll see if I can find it and send it to you. Awesome. Please yeah. do. So, uh, to get back to writing devotionals, um, yes. and I like, I like to pick people's brains about things that I'm trying to do mm. so that I can do them better. Cool. Um, I have you on my podcast. It's a ruse, uh, so that I can educate myself for free. So awesome. <laughs> yeah. It's a little, it's a great little grift that I have going here. Um, so you are digging into commentaries, you're looking at languages, you're meditating on the text and how it can be applicable. And then what, you just sit down and like five points, five things I think about this or? So the way we have it structured, and this is, this comes uh, not from me, but because I write for a broader ministry, 
Um, sure. There is like a set kind of outline that we do. So um, the bulk of it is like uh, kind of what is happening in the text. Um, it, since we're in Genesis, it's a lot of like people doing things. So talking about right. like, you know, um, for example, okay, I'll, I'll give you an example, like walk through a text, right? We'll talk about uh, Noah's Ark, um, for example, and Noah and his family obey, right? They get on the ark. What happens? God Everyone closes the door of the dies. ark. Oh, okay. Well, God, God closes the door of the ark. So God mm -hmm. is the one. He doesn't make them leave somebody behind to close the door. Right. He's not like making people um, like they're not responsible for their own protection. God is the one doing it. He closes the door okay. of the ark. Um, and then it rains for 40 days, 40 nights. Mm -hmm. No, they wait seven days and then it starts to rain. Can you imagine mm. being Noah and like sitting in the ark for seven days waiting for the rain to even start? He didn't like climb out the top like, God, what are you doing? <laughs> right. I look like a fool. And I'm sure he was mocked, right? During I'm that sure. whole period. I'm, I'm sure. But so you think mm. about like the faith that it took to even get in there. Right. But the faith to stay in there for seven days is wild. So anyway, yeah. talk about those things. And then we sort of have this like a application piece at the end and talk about like, um, I don't remember what my specific application would be in this for that devotion that I wrote. But, you know, you could talk about uh, how great it is that we have like God gave us his word and preserved for us these stories of these people who are f who have all kinds of problems. And yet they had the faith that we should be emulating in those situations. Yeah. Like what a cool thing that God provides these pictures of what faith looks like for us, even if they're yeah. like not great. Like obviously he gets out of the ark and gets drunk and whatever. Like he's not perfect. He's not, he's not our savior, but like we do have great examples of men and women of faith in scripture that we can look at. Yeah. What well, does show us, it does show us that even if you're not perfect, like there, you can, you can still rely on God and God still saves you, you know? Yes. Yeah. So. I don't know. There could be an application there with God doing the thing. God is the one closing the door of the ark. Right. It's all, yeah. it's all according to his timing. He's the one who orchestrates the salvation of his people. You know? There, there would be an application, I think about maybe, not God, I hate to say this and sound this way, but like God's timing versus your timing. Yeah. Right. No, it, it, that is absolutely something that is applicable to people. So neat. I don't know if that was really helpful, but like <laughs> kind of walking through the different vantage points that you can look at a text from and saying yeah. like, if I were talking to someone in my congregation, what are some of the main takeaways that I would want them to see in this text and sure. then walk them through I mean, script, you can read the same story in scripture a million times and come up with a ton of different ways to talk about it. So yeah. sometimes it's sad because you're, and you're writing a devotion, you're like, I could talk about four million things about how <laughs> cool God is and all of the amazing things that he does. Um, and you have to kind of restrict it to one to make it make sense. But yeah, um, but yeah I think knowing that you can come back and do a devotion on it again and like have it be something yeah. different. It's, it's definitely worth jotting down like all the different ideas because you're right. You can always circle back like, okay, I'm going to talk about this this time, but like a year from now or six months from now or whatever, I could always just come back and here's this other thing. And I've got like four more, you know, goes at this that I have like different ideas and, you know, vantage For points sure. that, yeah. Yeah. And that it'll help your preaching too. If you're, if you're consistently doing like looking at things from kind of a devotional lens, it's going to be mm. different than, than a teaching lens. Um, sure. And it's going to, the old ladies love it. They love it. <laughs> so when amazing. you're preaching, you, if you throw a little nugget in, like of something a little bit more devotional, the old women, they will love that. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, which is great. You always want them on your side. For sure. Um, yeah, absolutely. And it, it, 
And I imagine too, especially like in the preaching context, you know, the old ladies love it, which is great. That's a dub all on its own, but also you're giving, you're giving people, I guess, something to kind of chew on a little bit as they leave. Cause you know, they're not really, I don't know. They're not really going to remember the sermon all that much. You know, they're going to remember highlights and standouts, you know, and they're going to remember the hymnody for the day. But I think that's probably about all people remember when they walk away from church. Yeah. You know? I think as as a lay person, obviously I'm not preaching, so don't uh don't take my word for it. But mm-hmm. as um as a writer who is also a lay person, I can tell you that the most important pieces of your sermon are always gonna be the introduction and the conclusion. Always. Sure. Yeah. And yeah. I would I would also say uh, 90% of, you know, pastors don't take advantage of that. And so if you really like get your point in like a cool condensed, like, like punch yeah. it at the end <laughs> with your like great points right. again at the end, <laughs> summarize it, people will remember it better. So, so I, but my problem is I don't have great points to punch at the end. I have like really <laughs> bad ones. I, I got to talk to your. Your vicarage supervisor, then I think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, He's got to work. No, on that. it's it. It's interesting. I actually I read a book by Kevin Mitnick. What was that book called? Dang, he died last year. I have no wow. idea who this is. That's sad, but um, I don't know who it is. Kevin Mitnick was he was probably the most famous computer hacker in the world. Um, and he was on the FBI's 10 most wanted list and he eventually got arrested. And after he got arrested, he cut a deal like to consult for the federal government to get out of jail. Um, that is the life. And, that yeah. is the way to get out of well, jail if you're going to do it. And <laughs> But like the, the crazy thing. So like when he was in jail, they wouldn't let him call anyone. His lawyer had to come see him in person because they were worried that if he could get access to a phone, he would be able to get out of jail somehow. And the reason they thought this was because even though he was a computer hacker and was able to gain access remotely to tons of computer systems, um, he really did not focus too much on programming and engineering like you would think a computer hacker was. His big thing was social engineering and human interaction because the weakest point of any computer system is the people running it. It's hard with all the encryption tools and everything to guess a password these days. It's very difficult to crack someone's password but it's super easy relatively to get them to just tell you their password and so if you call up with the story that you're jim from it and oh my god my boss is going to kill me if i don't get this update put through and the whole system's going to come down and he's going to know it's my fault and please lisa please help me out i'm going to lose my job i got three kids you've got to help me out all i need is your password i already have your username all i need i just i know i just i locked myself out of my tool to log into your computer can you just please help me out And that was how he did it. And he pointed out the book was called The Art of Deception. Um, And I read it and it came out in 2002. I read it in high school. It's wild that they would let him publish that. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I guess sort of uh, forewarned is forearmed, I guess. I don't, however that phrase goes, you know, but I like if you know, if you know, you're better able to defend against it. But one of the things he said was something you actually just said was that people will always remember the first set of questions you ask them and the last set of questions you ask them, and they will never remember anything in the middle. They remember how you opened the conversation and they remember how you closed it. But the middle stuff, well, you know, we just talked about, you know, if you're pretending to be an IT guy, you pack all of your highly sensitive questions in the middle and you open with, a story about why you need their help and you close with talking about your family and thank you so much for helping me because they'll remember he was really desperate and he has a really nice family and he was such a nice guy. And in the middle, we just talked about, I don't know, computer stuff that I didn't understand. Yep. Right. And you kind of get away sort of scot-free that way. Um, and it's just really interesting that that, that that psychology kind of holds with people universally. We're going to remember what's up front because that's when we start paying attention and then we're going to remember at the end because we get, oh, I got a cue back in here. We're, we're wrapping it up. But all the stuff in the middle, we kind of, our minds wander, huh? We daydream. We, you know, yeah. pick up you on something get more, weird. and More fire and brimstone maybe 
and then maybe people will tune back in a little sooner. You can start that's yelling. That's right. That's right. Pounding yeah, yeah. the pulpit, um, you know. Yeah. Well, and uh, who was it? Sinners in the hands of an angry God. Yeah. Um, Jonathan Edwards. Edwards. Yeah. Edwards uh, he, didn't have that problem. No, I mean he was super autistic. I mean he just stood there and <laughs> and no, really, like I okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, context. I studied literature at a reformed Presbyterian college, so like we. Like I studied this stuff, but he like, he would just stand there with the paper in his face and just read very quietly and monotone the whole thing. So like sinners in the hands of an yeah. angry God was like monotone. I've heard that. I've heard yeah. that, that he wasn't, he wasn't like bellowing, like all these independent fundamentalist Baptists, like you imagine he wasn't doing that at all. No, not at all. No, he was just monotone, quiet yeah. from the pulpit, head down. Yeah. One of the things I learned from um, our our wonderful and blessed seminary president, Dr. Lines, uh, in a class of his, was that when Luther would preach, because we're reading, we were reading Luther's sermons, and we are done with them in five minutes, you know, like reading them out loud as a class, you know, five to ten minutes, and we're done with the sermon. And um, we're all like, man, this is short. But Luther's preaching time was significantly longer than that five to 10 minutes. And it's not because he's embellishing. It's because when he would preach, he would speak slowly and deliberately. And also and in German. Emphasize the things you <laughs> need to hear, you know, and like, that's so fascinating. Yeah. Like you can, I, I guess you can keep people's attention that way. Yeah. I mean, Walther would still want it to be longer. He said 45 minutes. Jeez. Jeez. And then Ferdy wants it to be shorter, you know? <laughs> Don't listen to Ferdy. No, well, no one ever should. No one ever <laughs> should, but I like Just contrasting. Ignore him. I like contrasting the two men. Um, mm. I like contrasting yeah. the two men. Yeah. It's sort of like a, a type anti-type kind of Yes, a, that works. So um, what's your favorite theological topic? Good question. Um, yes. I'm good at this. So I am really, really into biblical theology. Um, okay. So talking about like types and antitypes in scripture mm -hmm. and like fulfillments of Old Testament things. So I, you know, love Peter Lightheart and... Klein and all of these people that sort of make those connections. I think that that's really fun. Um, I think maybe it's, it's probably because I'm a literature person, like my undergrad is in literature, mm -hmm. love books. And so seeing themes in scripture is really my go-to thing. Sure. So like if Jordan and I sit down for a Bible study, he's going to pull out very different things than I will, because I'm looking at it like, the whole Bible is, you know, yeah, yeah them thematically connected. You know, I'm remembering a way something's phrased somewhere else in the scriptures. And he's like very systematic. Um, and I love that because I, I think it's like really fun to study the Bible with yeah. my husband. <laughs> so, yeah. But yeah, I, so I tend to be that person who's like, do you want to see my chart about <laughs> like, about like, I don't know, like ways the that Charlie Day meme. That yeah, exactly. No, that's literally me. <laughs> I so anytime I'm teaching a Bible study, um, because for for a while I was doing full time college ministry at Cornell, and mm -hmm. so I was leading Bible studies with like full of these women, and I like got a whiteboard, <laughs> like trying to make my points with my whiteboard. Um, it it is a thing. I have charts. I love charts. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so I have to ask you. Yes. What is the most bonkers like okay what is a biblical connection that this this thing is that thing okay so um like mary and the ark of the covenant okay right okay so what what is a connection like that that this thing is that thing that the first time you heard it you were like no that's insane but then you thought about it and we're like wait that's that's actually pretty good 
I think the. I hope you enjoyed that interview man. with Lisa Cooper. Listen, if you want more short form weekly videos just like that, make sure you become a member over at LutheranAnswers.com. That was a part of my Table Talk series, which releases every Monday, featuring different short-form interviews, including part two with Lisa Cooper next Monday. Thanks.